Hello, everybody. You may have just watched the video I did with Jill about 15 minutes ago. I'm back on my page. I'm going live again because I have a new batch of friends we're going to be chatting with. This is real time in real time. And today, I am so excited. Words can barely describe it. Three reasons. Because we're going to talk about cardio does not make you fat. Secondly, we had snow up in the very high peaks of Park City yesterday. And this morning, I saw some snow up on very high mountain peaks as well. And it's June 30th. Snow on June 30th. We had snow two weeks ago. We had snow on June 30th. This is the latest that I remember ever seeing snow in Park City, which is awesome. And the third thing I'm really stoked about is I got my sea salt right here because I'm still fasting. And speaking of fasting, actually, there's four things I'm super stoked about. Jason and I's special guest today is none other than Doug Orchard. Doug is a great friend of mine. He is one of the number... I'd say he's in the top five of documentary film producers in the world. He won't let me say that he's the best. I say he's the best because I've seen a lot of documentary films. I'm not saying he's the best. All right, pardon me. I'm not saying he's the best because I wasn't featured in a couple of his films. I'm saying he's the best because he's the best and I tell the truth. And I give you people the hard, cold facts. And if you have not seen any of his films yet, I highly suggest you go to Amazon Prime or iTunes or just hit him up directly or hit me up or hit Jason up and we'll send you to where you got to go to watch his films because they're very thought provoking. Oftentimes, most of the time, Doug does re deep research on the history of fitness and the history of exercise and what's really going on out there in the world. And his movies break down like social barriers, racial barriers, all these other things that are causing all this tumultuous problems in the world right now. He goes deep into the weeds with all that stuff. And he was doing this before it even became a problem in the world. He recognized it. So in my opinion, he's a bit of a, um, that's what I'm looking for. Um, visionary, I think is a good word. So anyway, that's the deal. We're going to talk about cardio does not make you fat. And we're going to talk about what happens when you do an extended fast. For all you people out there fasting, that's why I was just eating sea salt because I'm about 17 hours fasted right now. As you can see, my energy is through the roof. I did 200 kettlebell snatches this morning. 2,000 jump ropes on my two-pound jump rope. And before that, I did a half hour um, of sprint intervals on an incline on a treadmill. Hour of workout, but it was 100%, I'm going to, pardon my French, balls to the wall workout. It was one of those days. And I did what my body wanted and what my body felt. So you have to think of yourself the same way every single day that you work out and exercise. Don't be afraid to work out. Don't be afraid to exercise, but work out to your capacity. And if you're not feeling a beef steak, high intensity, ramped up workout like I did today, just feel it out and do what works best for you. If it's yoga, do yoga. If it's go for a swim, go for a swim. I don't suggest swimming chlorine, but go for a swim in an ocean or a lake. If it's doing a beefcake workout, do a beefcake workout. But honor your body. Always honor your body. Honor your neighbor and honor your diet as well. So we're going to talk about all this stuff that I just rambled on about. And I tend to ramble on, so please forgive me. Because remember, there's two gerbil wheels inside my head. They constantly go around like this, 100 miles an hour, and I never know what those gerbils are going to produce. They kind of produce electron, like hydro, hydraulic energy in my head, and whatever comes to me, comes to me. So, with that being the case, Jason, welcome from Grenada. Doug, welcome from Florida. We are so stoked to talk to you both today. I'm going to get a sip of water. Hey, Kevin, thanks for having me. And, and Jason, it's great to meet you. You bet. Same here, Doug. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be on the show, as usual. Looking forward to today's episode. Awesome. So, I have um, a question for both of you. Have you ever seen any fat monkeys swinging around in trees? <laughs> not, in, nope. not in real life, no. Maybe the cartoons, I've never seen a, not in real life. I've never seen a fat monkey. What do they do? They swing from tree to tree, they run around on the ground, and they eat bananas all day. I know the two biggest fears are I hear about people, don't eat bananas because they make you fat. Don't do cardio because they make you fat. There's this dude, and I'm not going to mention any names, but I'm seeing this advertisement for this guy preaching his stuff. I'm not going to say what it is or anything, but I've been seeing, and he's not the only one. I have seen so many of these, these people pimping these products and stuff like that. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not against supplements at all, especially with today's technology, especially with the amount of exercise I do and the things that I do. I need a lot of, I don't need a lot of stuff. I need things here and there. And I use things that are like smart that I think work. And I, I go into the weeds and I look at supplements and I find if they have artificial sweeteners, artificial colors, junk products in them. And usually I dispose of them in the highly explosive reboots, which stay tuned for those they are coming up. But in a big picture, there's a time and place for everything. 
But where there's not a time or place for is bad information from bad actors and bad bunk products. And people trying to tell you that cardio makes you fat is a complete bull-faced lie. So I'm gonna ask you two guys, do you do cardio? And what kind of cardio do you do? Now, recognize this fact. Cardio is not necessarily just running on a treadmill. It is when you get your heart rate up and you're burning calories, that's considered cardio. So technically, if you're doing a circuit workout, you're doing cardio. If you're doing intensity weight training and you're sweating profusely, you're doing cardio. It's a blend of things. So to say, to just like blatantly say cardio makes you fat, there are so many elements of cardio that you don't know about. You can't just say cardio makes you fat. So what kind of cardio do you guys do? And what is your take on this whole cardio makes you fat thing? Tell them let you go first. Okay, so first off, the cardio makes you fat. Let's talk about what my take is. Um, I've seen these ads. They're on YouTube. They start in a lot of, a lot of diff before a lot of different videos. Um, and I think it's just, you know, clickbait to get people to click the, the reality. I learn everything. My best information I've ever learned was out in nature. Um, you know, John Muir, that's how he learned his best contributions to the world. It's he just went out there and stared at a tree, stared at the mountains and went, Hey, glaciers formed this one, which was completely contrary to everyone, what everyone was thinking at the time. You can learn a lot when you actually study nature. And um, when I hiked on the John Muir Trail, a portion of that is the Pacific Crest Trail. It's a trail that goes from um, Mexico up to Canada. And there's these through hikers that do a thousand, a couple thousand people do it each year. And they hike all the way through. And, um, and so I meet them, they're all different ages. I remember meeting a 65 year old woman who didn't hike much at all. And she just started the hike. And I, she looked like she was trying to catch up to someone. She was walking so fast. I thought there was someone, I looked behind me just to see, did I not, is there someone just came from a tree or something she's trying to catch up to? I mean, she was hauling. And so I stopped her and, hey, are you through hiker or whatever? And she was politely talked to me as she's kind of ready to keep moving. Um, and it wasn't that she was in a hurry. It's just, that's the walking pace. When you walk every day for so long, your pace just increases to the point that they were super fast. Um, just, they covered 25 miles a day, like nothing. Um, carrying a pack of all their food and everything else. And they're doing, every, they're doing it all right. But I never saw one who was even had a, you know, an inch. Like they, there was no five pounds of glamor weight that needed to be lost on these individuals. And they're only doing cardio. None of them were, I talked to them, none of them doing push-ups in the morning or they're not doing anything else. They're just doing cardio. And so, and the heart rate that they were doing at that pace of walking was definitely an elevated, you know, fat burning mode, um, 10 hours a day walk. Wow. And, and so, but they're doing it all right. They were also getting the sun they needed. They were getting the fresh air, the nature. They were going to bed and getting up with the sun. All of that. The food, the diet probably could be definitely improved because when you're backpacking, you're very compromised to you know the stuff that you could put in those like mountain house or whatever. Um, but otherwise, they're doing it all correctly, and um, and they weren't fat. And and this is a story of humanity. It, no one's get the problems of people getting fat is not because America is doing too much cardio. <laughs> That's not <laughs> right? the problem. Right? That's like the least of our worries. <laughs> And what cardio do I do? Well, you know, I have a varied, I say my best cardio that I ever do is kettlebell. That's why nice. Kevin, I'll be working with you on that for sure. Yeah. Um, no question. And then the SE routine, the strength and endurance routine that the Lost Sierra program that uh, kind of rediscovered and unearthed with I need you it. and Ron Jones and everything. And uh, that, that thing just is amazing. Time out. I need to uh, pause for are, two seconds. I need to pause yep. for two seconds and go right back. Hold your thought. By the way, everyone, uh, the Lost Sierra routine is um, depicted in the Motivation Factor, too, one of Doug's films. So if you haven't seen that yet, I know Doug and I did a, um, we did a live together a couple weeks ago. We talked about it, but I want to reiterate that in case there's new listeners out there. Motivation Factor is a game changer. So check that out. Okay, Doug, go ahead. So L L Lost Sierra routine. I agree 100% with that. I love it. Jason, I got to teach that to you, man. You love it. That's sure. right. Go ahead, yeah, Doug. it has different right. levels, too. Just when you think, oh, it's no big deal you're realizing that you double everything and, and you go from the white level to the red level. These are colors of shorts that they had. Um, and, then, um, and then you double for, uh, again and you're up to the blue level. So you're doing everything 20, 
you're doing 20, 20 times instead of five times, five reps of each thing. Or was, five. Let's expand a little bit on the La Sierra routine, just so people kind of yeah. know kind of what it is. So it's called the La Sierra strength endurance routine because it's a combination of, of strength and endurance in a short block of time. So the first level is white level, right, Doug? Is that it? Right, right, right. And that's, that's what everybody, all the freshmen of that school had to do when they came in. First day. <laughs> First day, white level. And, and the goal was to get out of white shorts by the end of their freshman year into the next level if you could. But no doubt, by the time you're a senior, you want to get out of those white shorts and into the red shorts. So when you think that the entire student body population, 99 point something percent were able to do that, which included other things like being able to do 10 pull-ups, Everybody, 99 point something percent of the school could do 10 pull-ups. That's crazy. That's Think about amazing. that. That is special force level for, for, for minimum qualifications. It's, it's fabulous. I mean, minimum level for Marines is three. Oh now, you're going to have a very good score. But it's just, it just shows what the human body could do that all of us could do. So anyway, that was, that was the foundation of that whole program was that La Sierra thing. So it was the calisthenics, it was the strength enduring, the hopping. All of these things had super, super important benefits. And when you're done, they call it the warm-up. But it's, I, this is a it's workout. It's more than a warm-up. <laughs> I would do it as a workout if I was in a hotel room sometimes. And I just have like the bed and the wall. And I have that little aisle. I would just turn sideways and do it, the whole thing in that. I was able to do that. I mean, I've never been anywhere that I couldn't do the strength endurance routine. Well, Jason and I last week talked about um, exercise in tight places. And when I was in um, Sparks, Nevada last month, well, about two months now, I had limited space. And I actually did the strength endurance routine two, two out of the three days I was there as part of my cardio routine. So, Jason, this is right in your wheelhouse because we talked about the, the whole like, body weight thing too last week and how you can, you can do things in confined spaces. So I think the strength endurance routine is perfect for that. Now, I've got a question, Jason, for you. How many pull-ups can you do? Do you ever do pull-ups? That's like Kenny. Yeah, I do. Um, 10 to 12. Really? 10 to 12. Yeah. Dude, you got to take a video of that, and you need to post it on one of our pages for the ladies. I love sure, this. but I, that's the underhand, right? Just oh, chin-ups. Chin-ups. Yeah. So chin-ups are a lot easier because you have more bicep activation. Right. Correct. And anytime overhand, correct. it's going to be more hard. Doug, how many, pull how many chin-ups and pull-ups can you do, Doug? Because I can do about probably 8 to 10 chin-ups. Good, clean, like full arm extension, a good, clean pull-up, mm -hmm. which that's a whole other story, people alone. And then pull-ups, I can probably do like six or seven perfectly good, clean ones. And then, then I'm compromised. Yeah. So, Doug, how many pull can you Pull-ups a bit tougher. Yeah. Well, I was doing sets, usually sets of eight. Um, I, I, I go out there and I do every morning. My warm-up is eight pull-ups and 15, 20 bar dips. I just do them super set back and forth until I do three sets of that. And then I start, it like mm -hmm. wakes me up. Um, Better than as far as quality, if you sat there and watched my quality, I think you'd, I, you think I do a pretty good job. I mean, I've, I've focused on that. I used to do a lot more. Um, but remember I blew out my shoulder, my, my elbows by overdoing a good thing. And I started doing, I had a pull-up bar in my door and I went in and out of it every time I used to do three. And it was a place I worked and I would do it all the way until um, 11 at night, 10 at night. Wow. And then I bumped up to five every time I went in and out. And then I bumped it up to 10. And when I bumped it up to 10, if you're doing exercise, that kind of high load on your, your, your joints, and you go all the way until 11 at night, that's stupid. And <laughs> I ripped apart, I ripped apart both elbows, one heel, the other one didn't until I eventually did a long fast and got the stem cells going and, and healed it up that way. I, I was, so it was that or surgery for where I was at. Yeah. Well, I once did a push-up challenge uh, back in 2003. Ironically, it was uh, Pavel Satsaline, one of his, his deals. So that's the guy. Really? That you just start, yeah, you just started following Pavel recently about the kettlebell? Yeah, on, on, on his Amazon Prime on the kettlebell. Yeah, so was... I was a big fan of his before – he um, really broke onto the U.S. scene as, as the big kettlebell specialist that he was. And I used to read his articles and all this stuff, like, early, like late 90s, early 2000s. And then I came across this one article he had written about this push-up challenge. And I, and I followed it. And basically, you get out of bed one day, you do as many push-ups as you can. And then there's like every day after that, you, you do a different percentage of that amount of push-ups every single hour on the hour. 
and then every day it varies for two weeks in a row. Holy smoke. I, and he, he recommended doing them on your knuckles. So at the time I was working at this lot for this glass sculptor and I was, I would, I would, I'd be sitting there polishing a, a piece of uh, artwork I look at my clock. I'm like, oh, I got to do my push-ups. I get on the floor and I do put, crank out like 10 push-ups, 10 push-ups. Like every, there was one day I had to do like 10 push-ups every 15 minutes for the whole entire day from the time I got up to the time I went to bed. And I ended up doing like 300 and some. My knuckles were literally bleeding by the end of the day. And I was like, holy crap. But in two weeks, I just got shredded. So here's a trick question for everybody. Was I doing cardio that day? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, because yeah, my heart rate was I mean, up. Not, not, it, not if you're doing five happened. or ten, but if you're doing a lot more, then you're definitely hitting it. Absolutely. And you know what? I didn't get fat. I lost like five pounds in a week. Cardio didn't make me fat. I don't no. know anybody. No, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I'll, I have seen people who only do cardio. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, I definitely – I mean, I know a guy, a good friend. I've uh, got to be careful because you're probably listening. I'm going to say it this way. I know people. <laughs> There we go. I, I've observed individuals who do like long distance running, you know, yes. and they do so much, eight, 10 miles a day or more. And uh, back in the day, they had quite a bit of belly fat mm -hmm. and they had a cruddy diet. I mean, they loved sugar and everything else, a lot of it. Um, and it wasn't enough to really tone it up. So I think that's the fate that they're trying to do, like cardio only. However, with that, I was also, like I said, on the Pacific Crest Trail where people were doing really brisk walking hitting it hard which was a little bit more involved than just a jog like mm -hmm. i don't know hiking's different but um and and no one had fat so um and but again they were doing more they're getting a, a whole whole gamut of other health benefits that were coming to play so yeah by itself cardio um is is huge but but it absolutely won't make you fat <laughs> it's the other <laughs> parts actually, that make you fat i'm gonna go into <laughs> I'm gonna go into the, um, I'm gonna geek out here for a second and tell you all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay this on the line so you all know this once and for all, why this, this theory of fat, cardio makes you fat is out there and, and comes about. So we can put it to rest once and for all. I'm gonna add to what Doug was saying and that those people out there who are cardio junkies or what did Ron used to call them enduros. So if you only do cardio every single right. day and you run, you get on a treadmill and you run like one mile per hour and you're an ultra marathoner, and that's the all same cardio, the same exact same cardio, thing. by the way. Yes. That, your that's body adapts medicine. and you do the same thing for hours in a row. And then your diet is kind of not so good. You eat, you eat red vines and M&Ms and some of these other things that I know a lot of enduros eat. Don't ask me why I'm not profiling. It's just- They, they, they do all those. That, they, it's it's Skittles. <laughs> Skittles. Skittles. They have Skittles. Skittles. <laughs> Artificial <laughs> color, artificial <laughs> flavor, red light number four, PNC red light number four. Bad news. But enduros like them, okay? And then they usually drink soda pop at the end of a long run race. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. If you do that same thing every single day, your body's going to adapt. You're probably going to get a little soft in the belly. You're probably going to have a little residual fat. But I still don't say cardio is going to make you fat. You're going to maintain your fat. You're going to hold your size. You're not going to have much change. You're not going to lose much weight. But you're going to stay in a maintenance zone. Cardio itself cannot make you fat. It's impossible. Anytime you're burning calories, you're going to lose weight. That's why fasting is so brilliant. Doug produced the movie and created the documentary film Fasting for crying out loud. There's a lot of research in that movie about the effect of fasting on weight loss. Jason and I are, we are specialists with it. We have a group of women down the Caribbean we work with, we've worked with for a year now, who have been losing 30 pounds, 40 pounds, 50 pounds. The list goes on and on. They're all on fire down there. We've created this big Caribbean meltdown. And it's amazing to watch right before our eyes that they are on fire with the whole fasting thing. Fasting works. Cardio works. They, they send us pictures of their, their, their sweaty bodies after their workouts. Guess what they were doing? Cardio. They show us videos of them sprinting up the road and doing all these different things. Cardio alone does not make you fat. It's absolutely impossible to do that. At the very least, if you overdo it on cardio, you're probably going to go into maintenance zone. You'll lose a little bit of weight for a while, and then you're going to plateau. And you may be soft. You may have a little bit of extra fat in your stomach. Your adrenals can get jacked up, too, if you do too much cardio. And then your hormones are going to be jacked up your ability to burn fat is going to be off. So the best way to switch all that around, actually, I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm going to pass the baton to Jason. And I'm going to let you add in a little bit. You've been awfully quiet down there in Grenada. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. But no, like, like you're right, please said, like cardio, again, it is a movement exercise. It gets it. Look at people who 
whose lifestyle involves a lot of movement, like people in the West Africa, these rural states where transportation vehicles are not a common thing like they are here in the Western world. That's a good point. Look at their disposition. Look at their anatomy. They are generally slim people. They are generally, you don't see them walking around with a beer gut. You don't see them suffering <laughs> from type 2 diabetes. You don't see them suffering from high cholesterol and these things. So that in itself should tell you the result of doing cardio. Now, again, to get the, if you hit the plateau states, pl fasting definitely is going to help you to break through and doing progressive workouts. So, again, like Doug mentioned, not doing the same thing over and over, but changing it up because your body is always trying to attain homeostasis. It's always yes. trying to get back in balance. It's trying, always trying to figure out, hey, what is this guy doing? Let me learn how to adapt to that. And whenever it adapts, it doesn't have the effect that it initially had. So your goal is to always be changing your workouts. It's, it's the same thing works in fasting too. Changing your protocols to ensure that your body never figures you out. That's the easiest way to put it. Yes. So that you can continue getting the results. Diversity is the word you're looking for right there. And that is absolutely that is the word. true. And also adding even two strength workouts a week into your protocols, people is going to accelerate your fat loss. If you are a cardio junkie, I would suggest doing that. If you do, if the person does a lot of cardio and you have flat line and you have a little bit of softness in your belly or a little bit of flab somewhere, throw two cardio work, uh, two uh, weight, strength training, weight training workouts into your protocol each week. And it doesn't have to be complicated or complex. The La Sierra routine would be absolutely perfect for that. The, the white level, 10 minutes long it takes approximately. That alone, I mean, I do that. It does not feel like, a, it doesn't feel like a warm up to me. It feels like, I just did sprints because that's how you feel when you're done. So, I mean. Hey, Kevin, Kevin, yeah. you should tell people uh, if they want to see what that looks like, they should go to motivationmovie.com. Motivationmovie.com. Go to motivationmovie.com. And, and there's, a, there's a link there for training and they can see, they can see the trailer stuff and that they want, they can actually get it. Where that's you, perfect. Kevin Rail and Ron Jones, I filmed it. Uh, we show you, it's a whole training thing. and and buy it and get it and you can do the SE that's, routine today that's and always great idea. yeah that's a great idea yeah, it's, and it's always yours so go do it and share it get the schools doing it get your your this is something that you do with other people ideally like it's that's the fun. that's the best use i mean you know, it's one of the few group exercises that's right there that's what it was designed that's its special sauce i'm going to jump in here intervene again and tell you this Last year, actually, it was exactly right now. I was out in Florida, Doug. Last, it was this week, right. last year. Yeah. Right? So when we ran on the beach that one day and did, we ah. did like 10 minutes run, 10 minutes. We did the, the white level. And then we did like three layers of that for 60 minutes. That workout we did was one of the top five most memorable workouts in my life. One of the top five best. It was, I had the most fun. We did it together. That was awesome. We were running on the beach. We had the sun. We had the sand beneath us. Immunity was boosting through the roof. Jason, I was down there, and I remember, I remember shot a video down there. I sit on the lounge chair. I don't know if you remember. Yep, I remember that one. Yeah, so um, do, you grab a Yeah, it was 90, 90 degrees. Kevin, oh. we ran five miles <laughs> fast, and we kept stop. We stopped three times to do the SC routine yep. all the way through three times. And thankfully, we had some water there. The, the ocean was probably 84, 84 degrees. Yep. Kind of cooled us <laughs> off. And then just kept running, but it wasn't early either. It wasn't no, it like was, it was six the in the sun morning. The was out. It was warm. Oh, it was. I thought it was like 10, 11 in the morning. So yeah, it was. And it was a warm day. I mean, we were pushing ninety degrees. So that was a workout. <laughs> it was un uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically late for me to be working out. But I didn't. Right. We didn't need to. We were filming something, and we didn't have to start it until whenever. So I'm like, oh, we'll, right. we'll, we'll work out whenever. And he came over. But that's a really good point of the the social connectedness of exercise. And that's kind of what the big principle behind the motivation factor is also about, is not social distancing, not physical distancing, but coming together with the meme of exercise. So we're gonna be taking a trip down the Caribbean eventually. And when we get there, the three of us are gonna do La Sierra together on a beach. Okay. <laughs> or somewhere. Yep, yep, sure. <laughs> and it's always so much more fun. Like I'm working out with my friend Jill over in the garage and it's, um, it's so much more fun when you have like someone pushing you next to you. And she's like, come on, 15 seconds, blah, blah, blah. Like just the motivating, it's literally the motivating factor. I don't mean to sound like um, reiterative or anything, but it's true. When you have one person next to you or two or three 
And I mean, I used to see that in my six pack challenge classes when I, when I taught them live, the energy just rises the more people that are there. And there's, a, there's an element of that. It just, it's like positive energy comes into the room and when you magnetize it by five or six or seven people that are all thinking positive and all having fun at the same time, it, it just puts it through the roof and it makes it so much easier, more comfortable and the time just flies by. Like when we did that workout last year, I would look at my watch, I'm like, oh, 10 minutes is up. It's time for the next La Sierra. And boom, we jump down and grab it and get up and go. And it just flew right by the time does. So if you are lacking motivation out there, people, I suggest you try to find an inroad of um, someone that can hold you accountable. Even if it is uh, just one friend or a family member or something like that, don't worry about the masks. Don't worry about the, the viruses and everything going around. You know what? Before COVID came to town, there were germs, there were colds, there was pneumonia. There was all these conditions that just got swept under the rug and people were sick left and right, going to doctors left and right, dropping out of the gym. I can't make it to class because I'm sick. I even heard of people, many more about being sick locally in Park City here. Yeah, on a global scale, big deal. It's, it's a problem. In Utah right now, it's a big problem. It's blowing up. There are three counties in Utah where all the problems are occurring. My county, there was 563 cases yesterday. But my town, there was 45 total, I think, for the whole entire coronavirus. And I don't live in fear. And I never have and I never will. And I won't allow anyone or anything to hold me down or stop me from doing positive things and putting positive chi forward. The minute you start living in fear and thinking in fear, your cortisol level goes through the roof. Insulin goes through the roof. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. Jason and I said this a million times. And your immunity goes that way. And your HGH goes that way. And you want your HGH to go up. And you want your cortisol to go down. And the best way to do that is not live in fear. And don't let anyone try to 100% control you. You are an individual for crying out loud. Jason, I don't know what the scene is like down there. I was looking at all the different states. Doug, what's the COVID situation in Florida? And then Jason, I want you to follow up and tell me what it's like down there. Well, well of course, of course, everybody's being tested now for work, for everything. And, uh, and so the numbers, we're, we're testing the people who were not symptomatic and you just have to be tested. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we're seeing a lot more people infected that caused the CDC to re um, change their estimate as far as how you know how deadly this thing really is, and and they are coming out with a number between 0.2 to 0.25 of a percent is if there's those exposed who would die. Now that's a very tiny number. Where that's not this is remember just for people to understand in math as we get to percentages here. Yeah, you know, two percent would be one thing, that'd be two out of a hundred, point two of a percent. Okay, now we're, we're not one out of a hundred, we're, we're point two of one. So we're 20% we're of one is what it is. So it's a very tiny number. Now, just to put that math in perspective, multiply that by 365 million people in America, and the number comes in, you know, it's less than half a million people would die of this thing if it just went out and killed everybody. And as bad as that sounds, 600,000 people will die this year of cancer. More people than that will die of heart disease. You know, mm -hmm. diabetes kills crazy numbers of people. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and if you're just a betting person and you're saying, well, you're, you're saying, oh, my only worry is the pandemic flu, uh, that would be statistically the wrong way to go. You need to protect yourself first for most individuals against cancer, against heart disease, mm -hmm. against diabetes, against the preventable illnesses that statistically you're gonna get, like you could, you could get. And, and so what the advice you're giving, Kevin, is, is really excellent advice, and that is do the things that are gonna make you a healthy individual to ward off all things Everything. that are gonna come your way, because it's, this isn't the only thing that's gonna come and potentially kill you. There's a whole bunch of stuff. And, and the reality is, um, you know, they, we could debate all, all along about whether this made sense for the, overre for the action or overreaction we did as a nation for this. Was it really necessary? And um, the other thing I was going to say, Kevin, is we saw in Florida that as we opened back up, and we, we kind of closed down last and opened up almost first, us in Texas yeah. and Arizona. And what we're seeing is the cases arise really fast. Yeah. And, and yet in most places I'm seeing masks people wear, which don't, don't really, I mean, I did a documentary truth about pandemic flu, where we talked about the kinds of 
protections you could wear to actually ward off the illness. Yeah. Where the government's requirement is not that it's an absolute joke. Um, so those face masks, you know, sure you might that might be your government's requirement but for you to, if you really are worried about this thing do not feel safe because someone's wearing a mask in front of you you've got to get far enough away that, that you're not going to get it from them yeah. that, that you just have to know that the government is lying to you right now i know this mm -hmm. i did the documentary truth about pandemic flu with uh, tommy thompson uh -huh. he was the former u.s health secretary he had just finished being that he wow. was a presidential candidate and he was a four-term governor in Wisconsin. And, um, and so what he, and he lined up the FDA and the CDC and the nation's top virologists in that film. And what he showed, what the film showed, we had uh, the president of Pasture Pharma, who was one of the big face manufacturers, N95, FDA approved N95 yeah. for the general public. What the film showed is there were two manufacturers that had gone through the hoops to prove that their N95 masks would be useful to protect a citizen, a person, in a pandemic. That they could put this thing on with basically no training and that it would provide protection for them in a pandemic. So it was 3M and it was Pasture Pharma. They both had two general use face um, masks, uh, N95 respirators. Those were designed to protect the individual wearing it. Mm -hmm. Those did not protect the person outside from it. So, so I'm not aware of anything. It's like Tyvek. That protects, I, I'm not aware of anything that protects someone else. And yet we're being wow. told to wear these things. To protect others. So that, to protect others. Yeah. And, and, and what's the requirement? And so on the CDC's website, not the FDA's website, the FDA lists those uh, manufacturers and those respirators for the general use. The film showed this, okay? This is back in 2000, and you can't get this. This is nowhere to be found anymore, this documentary, but um, I was just a director for it. it uh, when the pandemic broke out, I went and looked, and, and, and I know this page of the, 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 the FDA site really, really well because we took photos of it, we had the graphics do all this work on it, and you know, just showed the public, here's, it, here's what it is. So originally the cdc said don't wear face masks right don't worry about it right and then about two weeks later they changed and they said go ahead and wear these things and recommended wow. it so that day i went back and looked at that page on the fda site which i've just looked at two weeks before it was there and it was there 2009 up here i think it probably was there the whole time i went back and looked the day they announced it and that section that showed that of that page was gone <laughs> gone wow. and what a so shock. What a surprise. So today, you could go out right now, legally, and get the absolute thinnest fabric you can find. Fabric so thin that you could just see right through this yeah. stuff. You could have little holes and whatever it wants, fabric. And you could just put a couple little, you could go get, you know, some fishing line. And, and just <laughs> hook it and just put it around your ear. And you are compliant. You can go into all the places you want to go to, <laughs> restaurants, wear this thing. And Fine. you are matching what all everyone's asking you to do. And let me just tell you that, or even the nicest one you make, or the whatever anyone's buying anywhere, you're not protecting anybody. From, from my understanding for this, if you believe that, if you say, well, it's better than nothing, which is what people say, well, maybe, maybe you shouldn't be stepping on cracks on the sidewalk or walking under a ladder or going <laughs> across the path of a black cat. <laughs> let's, just, let's just throw it all in there. Yeah. But if you're actually interested in science mm -hmm. or in history, since we learned from both of these, because the film kind of pointed, pointed out and kind of mocked the people during Spanish flu who were wearing this, these yeah. fabric things with gaps in them. We're like, that didn't work. <laughs> they didn't work. People died. Like, it didn't work. And it's not working today. So, you know, it doesn't matter what happens. America needs to understand. Half a million people are going to die, if that's the number. It's going to be 300,000, half a million. The vaccination will not come out before it. Who, those who are going to die are going to die. The rest of you won't. So, so get healthy, stay healthy, eat right. This is not the time to be gorging on donuts. This is the nope. time, Skittles, and, nope. and what were the red vines? I mean, this is the time <laughs> to take on the healthy diet. This is the time to do, you know, the lifestyle changes. If, yes. if you're not motivated right now, I don't know what, you, what's gonna, right? what it's going to take. Exactly. I mean, literally, I've been saying that since Jason and I have been talking about before the coronavirus even came to town. You need to take ownership right now. Now's the time. Blah, blah, blah. It is. It's the present moment. 
And then when the coronavirus hit, I was like animate about, now is the time to really focus on your health and really get into, get strong and really boost your immune system, really improve your gut health, really improve your brain health, really improve your relationships. You have time to focus and think you're quarantined, you're at home. Now's not the time to put on the quarantine 15. Now is the time to do all the opposite things. They're gonna boot, yeah, people should be scared. Yeah, they should be scared like, oh my gosh, I just had a reality check. I could get really sick if this thing hits me. I need to take ownership for my health and I need to boost my immune system and get in the best shape of my life. And now is the time to do it. And there's about one out of 2000 people maybe have done that. But still people are just like, it's, it's, to me, it's like the magic, the magic bullet or the magic pill theory. Watching the, the, the idiot talk about cardio makes you fat and listening to him and buying his stuff is like someone saying, oh, I'll, I'll just wear a mask, I'll wear a hat and gloves and glasses and hide myself from society and do whatever everyone tells me to do instead of taking ownership and boosting my immune system to become impervious. That's what everybody should be doing. That well, you know, they, they, all they, the news they want to be about. All the news and on TV is about that. All the excitement about a vaccination. Let's just talk about that for a minute. You know, we have vaccinations for flu. We have vaccinations for a lot of things. People, um, those are still dependent in the end on your body's immune system to actually it is. work. You're absolutely and, right. and so what should concern Americans most in a pecking order is the big killers. The big killers, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, these, are, mm -hmm. these are things that didn't exist in the quantity that we're seeing in, over the last hundred years. You know, you know, in the 1800s, uh, they didn't have these problems like we do today. Um, and so, and, and again, uh, I always keep saying this, but in the year 1850 in London, England, men lived longer. If you tease out those who die by age five, the kids who die, if you get rid of, because we become very good at keeping infants alive. Um, but if you happen to hit age five in London, right. England in 1850, or you hit age five today, those who were alive, men, in 1850, London, England, lived longer than the men are living today in America right now. Wow. And that's without any of those technologies. So what changed? The parts we are talking about, Kevin, these are the basic fundamental lifestyles that made humans healthy. And we have lost that. And, yeah. and so as a filmmaker, I'm interested in the nexus between what history demonstrated through a thousand or plus years, where we could see that was beneficial for, for humans. And then also what science has rediscovered or proven to be effective, when they both are pointing that exact same way, that's the film I like to make. Uh, that's the film I know is gonna be absolutely correct 25 years, yes. 75 years from now, 100 years from now. I'm good and I'm not gonna have a problem. I'm not gonna be Oh, that guy, remember he came out with that thing and everyone laughing. That's not going to be the case. You can watch fasting right now, the way I edited that. You can watch fasting 100 years from now. It's still going to be the case. Motivation factor, it's still the case. That's very safe. So I like to stay in that lane. Yeah. And what frustrates me right now as Americans and as people all over the world, the disease that spread is we no longer listen to either history or science. We say we do. We'll cite something, but we really don't. Yeah. We just don't. Um, I want to know, um, I have a question for you, Jason. Um, I'm actually going back to what I wanted to know before, which is what is the state, what's the current state of the coronavirus down in the Caribbean right now? Cause I know it's, I kind of have a good land map of what's happening in America. Like my home state of PA, mm -hmm. like I'm looking at all the graphs and it's, it's like, it's, it's gradually going down, 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 down. Um, there's a couple states where it's like really low right now, like almost to the point where I'm like, I think it's going to be just like all the things are going to be lifted and everyone's going to be able to go back to doing group things again. But then there's like maybe five to six states that it's like, it's blossoming and people are telling me it's all, I don't, I'm not getting political here. I'm just stating facts people. So don't jump down my throat. The mainly Trump supporting states allegedly are the ones that have the highest cases right now in America. That's what I was told. And I, I literally do not watch the news. I don't watch anything. I try to boost my immunity and my health every single day. I try to spread love and positive chi, and I try to motivate people. That's what I do. That is my career path. That so, was uh, yesterday, this, Kevin. That was yesterday. Yeah. Today, Wall Street Journal showed the entire West Coast seaboard. So we're talking about Washington, Oregon, and California all have that problem. Oh, really? So what we're seeing is as they open up, see, I said Florida and Texas, we opened up earlier. Yeah. So we started having that problem earlier. And as the other states are opening up, it's, it's opening back up. Because the truth is this. I always said this. Everybody thought this. I think most everyone thought this is, okay, we're going to shut down. 
we're going to shut down completely and just we wanted to flatten the curve. Yeah. But what happens when we open back up? Because it's right. not gone. It's just going to hold of course, on for a little while. All we did is so now we're seeing what happened. Um, and uh, and and what happens is, and if it's, especially if you increase the testing and so that everybody's getting tested and all this stuff, um, you're going to see that that thing is just spiraling out of control. The death rate in the United States yesterday was 373 people. Now. If I multiplied on a calculator, 373 times, um, let's see what I multiply by. I, uh, no, I divided that by how many deaths we had, which is 127,000 deaths in America have happened so far by this thing, supposedly. So I multiplied that, divide those two, and it came out to be 373 days, something like that, over a year. So if we had as many people dying per day now, it would have taken over a year to get to this moment which is really interesting. So in two weeks from now, now that we've been opened, it'll be, see, it'll be interesting to see if we're going back up to 1,000 or 1,200 deaths a day, or if we're really, what's going on is it's just a bunch of people who, who aren't gonna diet from it or getting it, and they're, they're testing, they're, they're fact checking them. Because the younger people who are exhibiting symptoms earlier, mm -hmm. they go to the hospital and they would say, ah, go home. Like, like we're, not, we're not even gonna test you. Yeah. They'll go to the doctor. No, you don't have the test because you're not the, 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 the group that we're really worried about yet. Mm -hmm. So they weren't even doing tests. Now they're doing it. So that's a factor. Now the newspapers are saying, well, that doesn't explain everything. It is going up. Well, of course it's going up. We're back open again. We're interacting. Mm -hmm. But is it a major problem? And, and all those political factors aside, honestly, for me, Doug Orchard, <laughs> What am I worried about? I mean, I, I am worried about the country. I want good things to happen for everybody. Yes. But, in the, but, but the government, I've been trying to make these movies to, to stop chronic illness, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, no one's really listening, but I too try. So I do care. But in the pecking order of things, I'm worried about my health overall. Yeah. And, and this thing really, because of my health level, it's not going to bother me. It's yeah. not going to bother you. It's not going to bother most people. And, um, and, but at the same time, I, I am considerate socially. Like I don't, I know some people are scared to death. They believe yeah. that if they get it, they will die. And yeah. maybe they will, some of those individuals. Okay. So that's, that's totally fine. But all of us should be concerned about cancer, diabetes, heart yes. disease, and so many other things. Um, the flu ranges from, you know, 25,000 to 69,000 a year die from the flu. Um, there was a little bit of uh, numbers that, that, I think that the CDC stopped counting the, the, the flu deaths. When I approached them, they couldn't give me any accounting on the flu after March 1st. Like, I was like, well, wait a second. We were on track to have 69,000 people die from the yeah. flu. I remember that. It suddenly stopped. It just like, disappeared. Like, they were saying this is the worst flu season we've had since 2017 or something. And right. then all of a sudden, flu gone. See a flu, yeah. COVID in. Yeah. Flu just got yeah, here. So, COVID. so you, know, you know, and then there's the discussions about accounting. All of those things uh, aside, it appears that the actual death rate, again, is 0.2 to 0.26. Some people say it's a little higher than that. Uh, they don't agree with the CDC. All those factors aside, you know what? It's a lot. There's still more people are going to die from cancer yeah. this year. Yeah. And uh, a big chunk of that is preventable stuff. Mm -hmm. Preventable. So... We are dying unnecessarily in America. And I love the fact that we're suddenly worried and concerned about our health as a country. Yeah. But right. super frustrated that uh, that isn't translating into becoming healthy people. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It came down to this thing that's happening to even start to wake people's eyes up and, and minds up about what their situation is with their health. And I was thinking... It's going to go one of two ways. People are going to get, gain weight and get worse and worse shape, or it's going to wake them up and they're going to go the opposite direction. So I, I think there's kind of like this tug of war going on right now, to be honest with you. And it's almost like a nation divided right now, big time. There's the mask wearers, the non-mask wearers. There's the people who say the COVID virus is real. There's some that say it's fake. There's people that say, well, I'm, I'm going to pitch in and I'll wear my mask to help prevent the spread, blah, blah, blah. There's people that look at you cross-eyed if you don't have a mask on because they said you're, you're hindering other people. You you're saving people by wearing a mask. And I'm like, but I don't have the COVID virus. How, so how am I saving them anymore if I wear a mask? I don't quite understand the dynamic there. Well, scientifically, me. there's no proof, no proof. No, yeah, I know. Zippo, nothing, nothing. There's yeah. nothing to show that that actually protects. 
And you know what I so, want to know? So, so I, I, I reject that every time I, I hear it. I, I just always reject it. I'm like, okay, you know, if you want to make that the law or you might make that the requirement, I comply. I'm, I'm an, I, I believe in honoring, you know, sustaining the law. I do that. Yes. But, same. same. But, but let's also, but it's frustrating when we're operating based on, you know, what is that? It, I, it, it's like, it's like the olden days, like we're going back 500 years and saying, oh, I, 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 it's really frustrating. If they were going to do that, they should have came out. The government should have given guidelines of this is the minimum precautions that we feel are at least 10% effective at stopping the virus as long as you're not coughing, sneezing, singing, or talking really loudly. Yeah. Because by the way, any of those things you exert so much pressure, it goes right through that mask. And, and so, and by, and by the way, I went through the airport, you know, when I saw you, Kevin, yeah. a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and as I, I went through the, all the airports and there were, every time I heard someone cough, I looked, I mean, everybody looks now. Someone coughs, you just look right there. You can't, it's like a bomb goes off or you know, gun, <laughs> guns will go off and bombs will go off. And that won't get people to look as fast as you hear someone cough. Like, what? So, um, and every time, every time I see the person putting the mask back over after they cough. So they're pulling it down, <laughs> coughing or sneezing in their sleeve, and putting it back on. Oh, my God. I've never seen an exception. And I want everyone to think about this. Have you seen an exception ever? Because it's disgusting to cough or sneeze in your own in face mask. mask. That's like, so you just don't do it. It's a natural reaction. And yet... People think, oh, I'll cough and sneeze in the face mask and I won't cover. Well, I, I'm sorry, but you know what? You aren't actually protecting anything with that thing, again, scientifically. So we're, we're sending a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. and, and again, people need to know, if I'm really susceptible, I need to stay in my house. Because you saw when everyone was in their house, they weren't having the problem. If, yeah. if, they're, if you're compromised, if you're really compromised, and you know who you are. Yeah. And the false sense of security, I'm going to use shoes as an example. I like to be barefoot, and I like to run barefoot, and I like to work out barefoot. And, you know, I'm not going to name the shoe companies, but you know the shoe companies, the big thick soles on them. They give people oh, the yeah. false sense of security that they can just hammer the crap out of their ankles and their feet and their heels for years on end running these fancy fluffy shoes. And that is a big false sense of security, in my opinion, because you're still pulverizing your joints, and you're not doing anything yeah. beneficial for your body other than pigeonholing your foot into – Ron was a huge supporter of, uh, actually, it was probably Ron that got me into barefoot running to start with years ago. Because he, he, he was once wearing those even five fingers. I'm like, what are those? And he started telling me about them. I started doing research. I'm like, holy cow, it makes so much sense. I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of my shoes. And I just started working my way to barefoot. And that's actually when we met, Doug, when you filmed me running barefoot down there. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And I've been a barefoot minimalist guy ever since then. And I'm like, shoes are a false sense of security, in my opinion. Your feet should be grounding, they should be ripping the ground. You should be working the muscles in the bottom of your feet. And it's, it's one of the areas of fitness that I don't think gets enough attention is foot health. That's a whole other show in itself. But I do need to ask, I'm, do, I'm curious about this. I have a client who's a um, doctor and I said to him, I want to know how many of the corona cases that came through the hospitals and the clinics and the doctor's offices all across America, how many of those people were wearing masks? And I bet you, I'd be willing to bet a high percentage of the people who've gotten coronavirus have worn masks since day one. And no one can, can tell me the facts. No one will tell me the facts. I'm pretty sure the doctors must know because they must ask them. I want to know how many of them wear masks. And if it's 70% or more, I would laugh in the face of the mask theory and I would throw it in the garbage. I would never come back to it ever again because it's a full case. Kevin, I'm, I, am, I am so confident right now that the people who made the decision to, to propose the masks were not the scientists at the CDC or the FDA because I met those individuals. I know what their opinion was on the topic. The science was already sound and shown, and there was a mil multi-million dollar process that these companies had to go through to get FDA approved general use GPUs um, for the public, general use public, whatever they are called. I can't remember, that, but they're called GPUs. So, um, and, and so when it came out, remember initial gut reaction CDC was, no, you don't need to do it. Um, and then, and then it changed. Mm -hmm. And so what we have right now going on is a bunch of preschool, uh, intelligent level people running the show. 
and on in our government of, across the board, both political parties. They're they're and we have the same level uh, here in understanding of science by the general population as well. Um, it's like anything you went to school to learn in science and history, you have just some huge amnesia effect has taken over. And I don't know, maybe there was only so much stuff could be stuffed in the brain and kept there. And but 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 you too much Twitter and Facebook of other facts and whatever stuff has crowded yeah. all that out now. And now we don't listen to those things. But but this is just an example. It's a hyper example um, of where we really are as a, as a society. And, and that is we've ignored things that really work, like things that really work. We're saying, hey, this, I'm sharing with you, I did this and, and I had this result, amazing result. We should probably talk about our fasting now. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and what happens, for example, is, okay, can I mention the fasting right now? What I just did? Sure. Yeah. So, so I just fasted uh, uh, four days, four day fast, and um, I dropped a ton of weight. Um, you know, I, I was in Utah, son got married and a bunch of stuff happened and, you know, I just ate too much food. So <laughs> I, it was, it was, but we did swing kettlebells at the park and got is, and you probably lost a pound or two when you were with me alone. Well, I was 194 <laughs> when we were met together. When I came back on Friday, this Friday, mm -hmm. uh, I weighed myself, weighed in when I woke up in the morning without water yet. I was 199.9. Wow. This morning I weighed myself. I'm 186. Wow. So nice it's work, Tuesday. Though. I was 186 yesterday morning on Monday morning. So in less than four days, I dropped a crazy amount of weight. So I, that was that yesterday. I ate two meals yesterday, steamed veggies and whatever. I shared with you, Kevin, what I ate. Yeah, poached egg um, and sauerkraut. Good stuff. Yeah. Well, that was this morning for breakfast. But oh. yesterday it was just, it was just steamed veggies. Along with and the second meal I had um, with a little bit of olive oil, I had steamed veggies with um, half of a uh, avocado, avocado and and that oh and some sauerkraut. Yeah, the first meal I didn't have any sauerkraut. So so I did that. Not a lot of calories in those two meals. Um, 186 again today. I'm gonna probably stay 186, 187. I'm not gonna climb back at all. Not even not one pound because I come off of this correctly. But the big shock to me was I happened to be at the doctor's office yesterday morning. And um, I'm all proud of my 186 weigh in based on where I was at Friday morning. So fasting, there's nothing else that will do that to you other than maybe getting food poisoning. <laughs> I had lost that much weight in about two days before getting food poisoning. And it was the last 4th of July. And you were with me at a oh, yeah, house that, we will, right. that will not Here. be named, who's one of the most famous you know, natural path sites or whatever in the world at his house. And somehow I got the, the bad. I was the only one that didn't get sick, I think. I haven't been killed. No, I, I, I just caught the wrong dosage of it. Um, I was lucky. That individual, he recycles his own personal waste and uses it, composts it and puts it back in the food. Um, and you know, he grows and I think that someone forgot to spray it off really well <laughs> on one of the leaves that I got. Oh what man, the imagination just thinking moves. about it all over. Oh boy. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so, but, but what was interesting to me is they tested my pulse and normally I'm 50 resting heart rate in the morning and I was 80. My resting heart rate was 88. Dude, I had has never been 80 for a resting heart rate. And then my, high, my blood pressure was 130. I'm, I'm 117. I was 130. I was freaking out, thinking something's wrong. I was kind of yelling at the person. I'm like, hey, you need to check your instruments. And are you sure you know how to check a pulse? <laughs> I feel so bad. I'm like, I'm like, man, I've been fasting. My numbers should be so low. Mm -hmm. But they weren't. They were the opposite. And so then I texted you and you go, oh, dude, yeah, you're Oregon. So now I get why we are counseled, don't exercise, especially don't exercise very hard when you're doing an extended fast because your body is working. It is in a cycle of cleansing out the system. Your heart's working super hard, but your organs are working, doing all these cleansing processes. It's like, you know, it's like the oven, when you put the oven on like deep clean, you don't open it up, right? And, and there's right. all these machines, we do that same thing. It's like, oh, I can't touch that right now. 
I can't turn my phone off right now. It's doing the, it's yeah. doing the whatever. Right you know, the you, we hit these modes. Mm -hmm. So our body has that too. And when we go into fasting state, um, different things happen at different times yep. throughout that process. But when we pass 48 hours, your body goes into a completely different state, which is super beneficial. Your, your stem cells are fired up and all these things are happening. It's off the Searching office. out. Yeah, it is, it is looking for inefficient cells to consume as energy sources. Um, and it's killing off precancerous cells. It's, it's um, cleaning up your skin, all, all, the, mar all the things that, that are precancerous or the cancers that are, are going bye bye. And it's amazing what happens in that process. But that's not the time to go out and hit it hard in your exercise because you're already tasking your system. If you've already got 130 blood pressure and you're, you're starting off at 80, you know, you just going to understand there's a limit there. You got to be wise. You definitely yeah, well, have to be wise. So go ahead. Well, like I've told you in the past, when I do a 48 hour fast, my first day is just another day at the office. It's no big deal. Yeah. yeah. The second day I already noticed my, my breathing is more labor. My heart rate is up. It's already elevated before I can work out. So I'm usually okay doing a beefcake workout on day number two. I don't suggest any of you listening out there do that. I'm, I'm, I don't want to sound egotistical, but I'm a seasoned veteran. I've been down this road a long time. If I'm going longer, if I do a three or four day fast, like last, this past winter, I did two day fast, three day fast, four day fast. I was alternating all over the place. On the third day and the fourth day, the rule of thumb is this. As your fast goes up like this, you don't want your exercise to go up. You want your exercise to come down. So the longer the fast, this is exercise is fasting. One day, two day, three day, four day. You see my exercise hand here? It's coming down and the fasting is going longer. You want to go less and less. I totally condone exercise during an extended fast. That's totally fine. But make it lighter each time to the point where if you're doing four days or five days, on that fourth or fifth day, it should be yoga. It should be um, a walk, 30 minute walk, not even a brisk walk, just a walk. Because believe you me, you're going to feel your heart, the effect of your heart rate. And Doug, when you told me what happened to you, it, it, it all made perfect sense to me because every time I do a longer fast, I feel that same thing. My heart rate is a lot higher. My heart, my, my resting heart rate is higher. I assume my blood pressure, my systolic especially is probably higher too. The ejection fraction is when your body, when your heart pumps the blood out, is probably higher because your organs are basically, it's a, it's a weird dynamic that happens in your body when you do those longer fasts because your organs actually start to atrophy. They start to break down a little bit. They're, they start to shrink. They're not working because you're not, you're not putting any kind of thing in your body to stimulate them. So it's like this good cop, bad cop kind of thing. If you get this cellular detox through the medium of autophagy like Doug was talking about, which usually starts about 40 hours plus. And then you hit about 300%, I think, at about a 48 hour mark, and you kind of flatline with the autophagy, but you continually go on that path. And your body, it's just like this. And this is why I don't like working out with food in my belly. When you eat food, your body goes into digestive mode, peristalsis. So if you have this, this nice big old meal with a chicken breast and a salad and an apple, and then you go to work, you go to work out at the gym, and you go on to a beefcake workout, you're gonna have a conflict of interest right there. There's gonna be two budding heads because blood flow is going to your stomach to help digest the food and break it down. And then you're starting to do clean and presses with heavy, heavy barbells, and then you're gonna start doing deadlifts. And all, all those big muscle group exercises, multi-joint exercises require a high amount of oxygen and blood to fulfill your energy needs. So all of a sudden the blood doesn't know where to go. Does it go to your stomach to digest food or does it go to your arms or your body? So the digestive process gets interrupted. Then you get stomach cramps and then your lungs get affected and you, your breathing goes through the roof. Then you get stomach cramps. I just think I just said that. And it feels like an elephant is standing on your stomach and your chest. So then what happens? It's, it's this big conflict of interest. So fasting is the same thing. If the longer you go, if you start doing beefcake workouts, all of a sudden you're asking your body to, to do something that it doesn't want to do. It wants to rest and it wants to recover. And it wants to scavenge all these cells out of your system. So if you're going to fast, that's great. How they condone it. But cut your workouts, scale your workouts back. So Jason, you recently did a 40-hour fast for the first time, didn't you? And you worked out? Am I wrong? Yeah. How long ago was it? Was that, did you do 48 hours? That was like a month ago. It wasn't, it wasn't 48. It was 66. Oh, 66. And you exercised yeah. all the time? Through? Yeah. How did you feel? The first workout, like the when I hit the 36 mark, it was like lethargy. But then okay. after that, after I broke past day number two, the energy levels were back up. I think it was using like my ketones or something. Okay. I wasn't feeling like tired or drained anymore. Perfect. 
So I see that too, Kevin. For me, um, it used to be day two was my hard day, the afternoon yeah. of the second day. And then eventually the hard day for me became the, the third day. Um, but always so far in my life, and I've done a lot of these, I do them quarterly at least. Yeah. I, sometimes I'll do them monthly, but I'll, I'll usually do them quarterly. And I, and I do them primarily for my skin because I, I'm the guy that has skin cancer all the time every year. And it all went away when I did these quarterly because it just cleans up my skin. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, that's that's one of the benefits for sure. The, the, the skin's the largest organ of the body. That, that's what it, it eats or largest amount of cells in the body. It, it eats that first. It's great. <laughs> and and um, <laughs> that is great. very helpful. So, so I've noticed that on day four when I wake up, it's like a normal day. Mm. I wake up mm. and I might be starving and dying on day three, like weak and just feeling like crap the, the third day when I go to bed. When I wake up in the morning, my body had taken, you know, Thanksgiving meal or it found something somewhere on my body and it consumed it. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and I'm feeling amazing. You know, it's converted it to energy, that fat. And uh, I wake up great. And that's, my personal best is in, in um, bar dips. You know, like I said, I'm a 10, 15 bar dip guy. Uh, best I did, I've always been on day four, typically 25, but uh, I hit 28. No, I think I may have even hit, I don't know if I hit 30, I got to 28. My son claimed that my form wasn't very good on the last five. He goes, Dad, you weren't locking out your, uh, you were going down, but anyway, the point is I got way up there and it was easy to do. And it was just like, I don't know, I could just do that all day long. But I didn't realize my heart was so compromised. And so this time, yesterday, once I realized that, I didn't do that. I decided purposefully I'm not going to because I thought it was a little bit too much work. And I just was a little concerned. So, but I could. And that's the point. The human body's designed that if you don't have food at some point, in that early stage, like about day four or whatever, it gives you more energy than you typically ever have in life. Mm -hmm. So that you can go out and get your food. I mean, whatever you need to do, you're starving, you know what, you can do stuff. And, and Ron Jones just sent me a super interesting, he's always studying stuff, a super interesting uh, account of individuals during the depression, these are Olympians, who because of the lack of food, Mm -hmm. it was it was no it was it was just common for them to have to go at least five days without any food wow they were just stuck without it and and humans throughout history when we really look at this we we see evidences of and stories and accounts of that of people having to basically hibernate for the winter like a yeah. bear you know you're just and, and you can do it. For most human beings, you know, the body stores fat for a reason. We, we keep on a little bit of it, and then it eats it when it needs it. So, um, and that's great. That works great. Uh, by the way, any teenage boys, they're the first to die. The, the fasting film showed. I, I don't know if, how, if they've even made it to the film, but when you look at what happened with those who eventually did cannibalism and, and whatnot in, um, oh, what was it called, Kevin? You remember? The, Donner Pass. The, Donner yeah, Pass. Donner, the Donner Party. Donner, Donner Party. Pass. Yeah. Yeah, the Donner Party, it was the teenage boys that succumbed the first. They got the least amount of fat reserves. They're burning high, high energy. They absolutely have to have food. So Amazing. I do not recommend at all to these young teenage male athletes that they do very long fasts. You know, now, 24-hour fasts, I see no issues for, for basically, you know, the anyway. population. For, you know, yeah. We're not seeing issues there um religions do that it's no issues uh, you know throughout throughout history yeah so so they could do that but something longer for that particular group and, and use, there's some exceptions you know when people who fast have pregnancy you know they they need to store up their fat reserves and all that so it wouldn't make sense yeah but the rest of our population we do benefit from fasts and learning how to incorporate that i think is really important and exciting like that's part of our solution uh, medically for a doctor to say, okay, you've got diabetes or you've got this, I'm going to put you on this regimen um, or what you guys are doing. You know, you're dealing with people who aren't completely fit and shape and they, they want to be. And so you're given a complete protocol of diet, exercise, and fasting. 
-hmm. in a method that's extremely beneficial to them and the results are astounding. So, and so, yeah, I plan to come down and film both of you and what you guys are doing down there uh, for my next fasting film. I'm super excited about doing that and, uh, and check it out. I mean, you got like hundreds of people that I could choose from that have been doing this. It's an amazing thing. I wish we were doing more of that here in the United States. We, we need to change people's health. And, Absolutely. And it's the easiest, quickest protocol, in my opinion, to change the landscape of the, the billion dollar healthcare crisis in the world, especially in the United States, in my opinion. And yeah. it is as simple. It is as simple as eating between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. And that's it. Three meals a day and no snacks in between. Start at 7, shut it down by 7 p.m. I mean, I think someone quoted that in a movie even. If, they, if everybody did that alone, it would move the needle to the left of the billion yeah, it was six to, it, was, it was 6 to 6. Um, 6 to 6, yeah. But then we had that yeah. time zone problem. But anyway, but yeah, you're right. You're right. Basically, yeah. you, you only have 12 hours that you get to eat max, uh, maximum. Your, your gut has to be empty 12 hours if it's going to fix and do what it's supposed to do. Yeah, and that alone is the simplest thing to do to change all the problems Step in my one. opinion yeah yep but you know they they proved they proved if you happen to be a mouse that all chronic illness goes away when you do time restricted eating that you basically follow a six to six schedule that's that one thing all chronic illness so diabetes heart disease cancer all of it gone now not that it's curing cancer but that it is extremely beneficial at preventing the cancer. So it's, it, it, you know, after your gut's been empty six, eight hours, it goes in that cleanup mode in the yeah. middle of the night. And it's going through and taking out the precancerous cells and, and doing all that cleansing, everything that needs to happen. It runs the dishwasher cycle, if you will. It's like a four hour process. And you want the whole process to run. You do not want to have some plates that, that had a bunch of lasagna and gut on it and eat it the next day and have the dishwasher run for like, you know, 10 or 15 seconds. Like that's not going to be exciting the next morning mm -hmm. so our bodies are that way our brains need this too it it, it it just makes us feel so great and and there's nothing that makes me feel more groggy than doing late night eating and then waking up same time next day and i just feel yep. like uh, it's like two or three the next day before i'm back to normal agreed True. i always struggle to sleep and like i have weird dreams and all kinds of weird stuff happens when i eat late right. we jason i just talked about the other night on our um I talked to the Caribbean ladies. And I was giving my uh, speech on how bad it affected me with just two days that I did that two weeks ago. And then last week I got right back on track. And we we're talking about weight loss. I got to throw one more thing. We're, we've, been, uh, we've been talking long enough. We're going to get going. But I got to put this in. You talked about your weight loss, Doug, in a short amount of time last week. And I'm going to throw one more part that does not make you fat out there because that was kind of like the, the main thing we started talking about. I was 188 pounds last Monday. And I weighed in this past Sunday. I did six days, six at 177, 177 wow. pounds because I, I cleaned my diet up really tight last week. I finished eating by like 6 p.m. or earlier every day last week. And I extended my 16 hour fast, like 17 hours, like two or three days last week. And I added a little extra cardio into my workouts, a second bout of cardio in the afternoon. I went for a, a power walk one day. I went for a 10 minute hike, 10 minutes from bottom of the hill to the top. My heart was pounding, came back down. And then I did a couple of bike rides. That's it, nothing fancy, just a little extra cardio. And guess what happened? It didn't make me fat, it made me thinner. So for all you people out there that are scared to death do cardio because you think it's gonna make you fat, it won't, I promise you that. Fasting is good, fasting will not make you fat either. Not eating is not gonna cause your metabolism to slow down and cause you to get fat. That's a lie, it's baloney. It doesn't even make sense. You sit still and your body is well, constantly burning Well, as fat. long as you're, if you're inside, 10 days if you're inside 10 days it won't affect your metabolism but anything any calorie restriction and fasting beyond 10 days my understanding is that does change your metabolism so mm -hmm. and, and and no one we're, that's listening right now is planning on going 10 days exactly so that's that's a so whole just, different just that, ball game. that little caveat in case some weird trolls listening in and oh, <laughs> even in the movie it says this oh there'll okay, be there trolls believe me there's gonna be plenty of trolls listening to us today they're always just the trolls I just go like this and say, it sounds like you need a hug. You need a hug, let me know, trolls, bullies. Because <laughs> you all need hugs. All you trolls and bullies out there, you need a hug. That's all there is to it. Stop the social distancing. Then you go out and do some cardio, make yeah. their brain feel better, <laughs> get some endorphins released so they're happier. Yeah, totally. All right, we got to wrap it up. It's getting late. Doug, 
thank you so much for talking to Smack with us today. We'd love to have you back on again down the road. And Jason and I are really Thanks. looking forward to um, being part of this next project you got going on. We're super stoked about that. Jason, thank you for uh, joining in as usual down in Grenada. Pick and all the rest of you out there listening, remember to drink your water. Jason, do the law down on me. I got to drink more water and I am. Remember to get at least eight hugs today for eight seconds. Remember to question everything that you're told or ram down your throat and do your own research and don't just listen to any, you know, Joe Smith down the street. And also, True. always live in the present moment. Always do at least one thing beyond your comfort zone every single day. And pick up at least one piece of trash every single day. And believe you me, there's plenty of it going around this earth. Until next time, this is Killer K-Rail. This is Rail Time in real time, and it has been a pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your day.